everyone. Uh, my name's Robert Saint. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Science here at the University of Melbourne, and it's my uh, very great pleasure to welcome you all here to tonight, this evening's lecture. Uh, before introducing Dr. Shermer, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri uh, people as the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting here tonight and pay respects to their elders, both past and present. I'm truly delighted to be here to introduce Dr. Michael Shermer to you. Dr. Shermer will be well known to many of you, I, I expect most of you, through his work as one of the world's leading science writers, science historians and, of course, sceptics. Dr. Shermer received his Bachelor of Arts in Psychology from Pepperdine University, Master of Arts in Experimental Psychology from California State University, uh, and PhD in the History of Science from Claremont Graduate University. For 20 years, he taught psychology, evolution, and the history of science, and he maintains his academic links through an adjunct professorship at Claremont Graduate University, and he was just telling me about some other uh, academic activities, some very exciting academic activities that uh, he's initiated very recently. Dr. Shermer plays a hugely important role as perhaps the world's highest profile sceptic. He's the founding publisher of Skeptic Magazine, the executive director of the Skeptic Society, and the host of the Skeptic's Distinguished Lecture Series at Caltech. He's also a monthly col columnist for Scientific American, the author of a number of best-selling books and the co-producer and host of the television series Exploring the Unknown. The celebrated evolutionary biologist Stephen Jay Gould said of Michael, as head of one of America's leading skeptic organisations and as a powerful activist and essayist in the service of this operational form of reason, he is an important figure in American public life. I'd like to extend that and comment that he's an important figure in public life in general. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Shermer with us tonight, so please welcome him to the lecture. Hi, every Wow, oh, I didn't turn around. Nice uh, group. Thanks for coming out. I really appreciate that. I'm here for the uh, Think Inc. conference. It was yesterday, and, uh, and then I'm in Sydney tomorrow. And, and uh, with you tonight, I got in a, a nice bike ride, thanks to my host this morning, uh, four hours down your coast and back up. And I was, I was really feeling like I was 25 again, because it turns out we had a tailwind all the way down. <laughs> and so then when we came back, I felt a lot older. Anyway, so... Uh, <laughs> And I got to visit your science museum uh, in the Melbourne Museum. It's a new display. If you've not been there, this is probably the best science museum I've ever seen. And I've pretty much visited most of them around the world. It's really great. It's fantastic. All these interactive displays, great fossils, and really cool stuff. So definitely go see that. Um, so I'm the publisher of this magazine, Skeptic Magazine. It's the quarterly publication of the uh, Skeptic Society. We're a 501c3 nonprofit science education organization devoted to testing claims of the paranormal, pseudoscience, fringe groups and cults, and claims of all kinds between good science, junk science, bad science, voodoo science, pathological science, non-science, and plain old nonsense. <laughs> and unless you've been abducted by aliens and been on Mars for the last few decades, you know there's a lot of it out there. Nonsense, that is. Some people call us debunkers, but let's face it, there's a lot of bunk that needs debunking, and that's part of our job. And uh, so each issue, by the way, if you join, you can uh, go to skeptic.com and, and, and become a member of the Skeptic Society. You get an actual membership. You can get yourself a little gold pin that says skeptic. Well, it's like one angstrom's thickness of gold, but it's gold nonetheless. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and you'll get a subscription to the magazine. You also get the, uh, the decoder ring that tells you what the, uh, the Da Vinci Code means. Uh, nothing. It's a novel. <laughs> When that book was popular, we got a lot of calls, a lot of media interviews on that, and I just kept saying, he just made it up. People do that. They just make stuff up. And sometimes they stamp nonfiction on the cover, and then that's what really messes things up. Uh, I'll never forget being on Bill Maurer's show with Whitley Stryber. He's Stryber. He's the guy that wrote that book, Communion, the first of the popular alien abduction books, the one that put the alien head on the cover that started the meme of this is what aliens look like, you know, with the big bulbous head and the almond-shaped eyes and the emaciated body and all that stuff. And we, we were in the green room together. I said, um, you know, well, what do you do for a living when, you know, you're not talking about writing about alien abductions? He says, well, I'm a science fiction a fantasy horror writer. I went, oh, <laughs> well, oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty much like the end of the story, right? 
Anyway, so every issue is, uh, it has a particular theme to it, like we did one on uh, the future of intelligence. Are people getting smarter or dumber? Well, I'm from Los Angeles, so you can imagine I have an opinion about this myself. <laughs> but it uh, turns out people are getting smarter. Uh, this is called the Flynn Effect, discovered by James Flynn, a psychologist who studies IQ. IQ scores have been going up three points every 10 years for almost a century now. And, uh, and no one's quite sure why. Flynn himself thinks it's uh, probably a sort of a collective cultural improvement in abstract reasoning, because it's the abstract reasoning portions of the IQ test that have been going up. Uh, not, the, not the portions where you learn something, but your, your ability to reason, you know, like manipulating figures in space, things like that. And uh, so that may have something to do with the spread of science education, I think, because science teaches you to think abstractly. Uh, and so that's a good thing. I think we're making progress there. Uh, we did one on uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, when will computers achieve human-level intelligence? And we concluded that we're five years away and always will be. <laughs> really, this is a hard, hard problem to solve because we don't even know what consciousness is. We don't really know how, how it is we're able to do what we're able to do. I mean, you probably saw the big story. This is a big, big thing in America when the IBM computer Watson won Jeopardy, this game show, this super popular game show uh, in which there's three contestants that have to uh, answer these really uh, difficult, tricky linguistic type questions, double meanings of words, things like that. And so this computer is pretty amazing. And he beat Ken, Je Ken Jennings, Ken Jen, the, the greatest Je Jeopardy champion of all time, who won 76 consecutive uh, episodes of Jeopardy. No one's ever come close to this. And Watson beat him. Do you think Watson knows that he won? Do you think when he got there at the end, he went, yes, oh, I beat Ken Jen, yes, boom. <laughs> no, I mean, he doesn't, he just is a computer answering questions, ability to manipulate language, and now they're using Watson uh, for medical diagnosis, uh, for, as an aid to doctors, to physicians for diagnosis. So, um, but that's still a far cry from really being human, right? Uh, we did one on 9-11 conspiracy theories. Was 9-11 a conspiracy? Well, yes, actually it was. 19 members of Al-Qaeda plotting to fly planes into buildings without telling us ahead of time constitutes a conspiracy. <laughs> but that's not what the 9-11 truthers think. They think it was an inside job by the Bush administration. Orchestrated the whole thing, planted all those bombs at just the right floors where the planes were going to hit ahead of time. They knew and orchestrated it, flying these planes with remote control devices and so on and so forth. Anyway, we lined them up, uh, you know, here's the claim, here's the answer, here's the claim, here's the answer, because that's what we do. But in short, uh, you know how we know that the Bush administration did not orchestrate 9-11? Because it worked. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that goes over really well in America, actually, <laughs> especially liberal audiences. So uh, this is the original Charles Ponzi of the eponymous po Ponzi schemes. Uh, so we did an issue on why people are gullible for financial scams, any kind of scams. But in particular, this was an affinity scam. Anybody that's a member of your tribe who is offering something, you drop your trust guard down. Uh, I mean, you, you sort of become more trusty without the usual skepticism um, because somebody in your own tribe certainly wouldn't cheat you, something like that. Turns out that my guy who wrote this story uh, lost half his life savings to Bernie Madoff, and he's an expert in cons. So that tells you anybody can uh, succumb to these. Uh, we've done quite a few issues on uh, climate change. Are you a global warming skeptic? Or are you skeptical of the global warming skeptics, which would make you a believer? So this is, uh, uh, this is kind of a naughty problem in language. What do you mean by skepticism? Well, we mean thoughtful inquiry. We mean scientific inquiry. We mean science is skeptical because most claims are not true. So we start with the assumption that whatever it is you believe is probably not true until you proved otherwise to us that it is. The burden of proof is on the claimant, not on the skeptics to disprove your claim. And, uh, and so at some point you get to where there's a consensus that this is probably true and this is probably not true and so on and that's kind of how science works. And so we then are faced with what about the people that don't come around to the evidence. And, th and this is one of, the, one of these hot button issues like creationism and evolution, intelligent design and evolution or climate change and, and so on. So, but even so, do you believe in global warming? This is not even a good question 
And this is like, say, do you believe in evolution? Do you believe in gravity? Well, yeah, <laughs> I hope so. Uh, I mean, it just is. It's not something you believe in. It's very different than saying, like, do you believe in civil liberties? Do you believe in, um, you know, free speech? You know, these are different kind of beliefs than is the earth getting warmer? Either it is or it isn't, and in principle, we should have the data to tell us, you know, generally for most observers to go, yeah, really, it's getting warmer. Uh, and whether it's human caused or not should at least in principle be able to be determined with more data. And that's a little bit different than say political or economic ideologies. And so, um, and then finally, none of that really matters because the world's gonna end in 2012. <laughs> so actually the world was supposed to end May 21st, but it didn't, but it turns out it wasn't really the end, it was Judgment Day. And so you have between May 21st and October 21st to you know, get your stuff together and come around to the right side. And so we'll see when October 21st comes, we'll still be around. And, <laughs> and after 2012 comes 2013. Anyway, so uh, I thought I'd uh, just walk you through some of the, um, the principles of, of skepticism. Oh, by the way, we do have our own dog. Um, <laughs> The skeptical dog. This is what we're facing up against. <laughs> and if you think people believe weird things in Australia, you should come to LA. Here's a conversation overheard on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. For the, this is the need of science education. Mom, I really like this. Cute. What's it made of? Wool. Like from a cow? Uh-huh. Duh, Ashley. All wool comes from a cow. Does cashmere come from a cow, too? Uh-huh. The boy cow or the girl cow? If there's any place that could really use a county fair, it's L.A. The boy cow. Oh, okay. Oh, you mean the one with the... With the tusks? The L.A. County Fair. Kinder, <laughs> simpler, funner. Those tusks will get you every time. <laughs> So in science, we're looking for uh, natural explanations for natural phenomena. And we always want to ask the what's more likely question. Did aliens traverse the vast distances of interstellar space and land in Farmer Bob's field in Puckerbrush, Kansas and make a crop circle that says skeptic.com to promote our webpage? <laughs> or did somebody with Photoshop make a slide for me? <laughs> Another way to say that is before we say something is out of this world, let's first make sure that it's not in this world. Again, what's more likely, that aliens traversed the vast distances of interstellar space and landed in Sacramento, California to help the governor in his job of saving my great state of California, which he didn't, uh, or does the World Weekly News just make stuff up? Well, we have no evidence of aliens landing anywhere. We have lots of evidence of tabloid newspapers making stuff up. So that's, I call that uh, uh, Hume's principle, that is, Hume's axiom, da David Hume asked the what's more likely question, that miracles happen, there's a suspension of natural law, or that people misinterpret, exaggerate, or even make stuff up. And he answered that question in his great book on, great chapter on miracles. I mean, let's look at that. Are aliens coming to Earth or UFOs or spacecraft? Here is a photograph of a UFO from my house in Pasadena, California. That's downtown LA here. And there's the UFO, that's the bush on my uh, front yard. If that UFO looks like a Buick hubcap, <clears throat> it's because that's what it was. <laughs> There's lots of ways to fake UFOs. We did this for a TV show. My daughter took this picture. I'm off on the side doing Frisbee tosses with hubcaps. That's one way to do it. You, have to, you, have, you do it with a cityscape from up on you know, a hilltop or something, and you can have the cityscape in the background. It's very dramatic. You can also take a big pane of glass and put double-sided tape on the back of pennies and coins, or coins and line them up. And, you know, different configurations of the UFOs hovering over your city. It's pretty cool. And you can take them to the UFO groups. They get very excited about this. <laughs> anyway, it's just sort of messing with their head. <laughs> this is not to say that all UFO photographs are faked, only that it's easy to fool people to thinking that they are. Most likely, they're other things. In, in Southern California, they're most likely experimental aircraft from uh, over on the other side of the hill in the Javi Desert where uh, there is a military base there, or further up in north of Las Vegas where Area 51 is, which is a top secret military test base for uh, testing experimental aircraft. So, but, and the B-2 bomber flies over my house every, uh, once a year, on January 1st at 8.05 a.m. 
just before the Rose Parade begins. It flies over from Edwards Air Force Base and swoops down across Colorado Boulevard, makes two runs, and it goes right over my house. And it is really spooky looking. I mean, it is this black triangular shaped thing, and it has that special paint that reflects no light. And it looks like a hole in the sky, and it makes no sound when it's coming at you. It's pretty loud when it, after it goes by. But, you know, if you didn't know about that, it's been declassified. We've all seen them. But, you know, if it was 20 years ago and I didn't know about it, and I'm out in the desert and it's dark or dusk and you can't quite make out what's going on and then you think you see something and then you tell your friends and, you know, it was big, really big, you know, like a thousand meters across flying at 750 miles an hour and it made a sharp right turn. How do you know it was a thousand meters across? It's dark. There's nothing around it. You know, so people just make up these measurements and then the measurements get exaggerated and pretty soon you've got yourself a genuine... UFO story, right? That probably most likely has a prosaic explanation, but even if it doesn't, the anomalies that are left unexplained do not constitute positive evidence in favor of your theory. They just are unexplained things, and that's okay in science to say, I don't know. These are three words that almost no, none of us like to say, I don't know. But it's okay to say that, right? We don't know lots of things. So, like in the case of the ufologist and me, uh, the only difference between us is about 5%. That is, the, the, the serious guys will say, yeah, yeah, I know, the B-2 bomber, the experimental aircraft, the weather balloon, the advertising plant, yes, 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 swamp gas, and so on. Uh, but what about the other 5% that don't have natural explanations? What about those? And I say, well, what about them? We don't have to do anything with them. Just let them sit there. They're just anomalies. All theories in science have anomalies that we can't explain with the mainstream theory. You don't throw out the whole mainstream theory because of the few anomalies. You just let them sit there. Or more importantly, you assign them to graduate students to give them something to do. <laughs> so they can get their thesis done, right? That's, that's what anomalies are for, is for pushing the envelope of uncertainty. Uh, but for many people, they concoct an entire worldview. This is what the whole 9-11 truth thing is about. How do you explain that this weird little noise happened at 10.04 and some firemen reported that it sounded like an explosion? I don't, I don't know. I wasn't there. You know, maybe it was glass popping out. Maybe it was one of those things that fell out of the window that fell you know, 500 feet. I don't know, but we don't, we don't have to concoct an entire theory around that. This is how to deal with anomalies. Okay, so I want to believe, you want to believe, we all believe all sorts of things. In fact, it's almost impossible not to form beliefs. This is from the iconic poster from X-Files. So my new book is about this subject. The thesis of which is that we form our beliefs for a whole variety of emotional, psychological, social, and cultural reasons, and after we form our beliefs, then we uh, justify them with reasons after the fact. And everybody does this, and smart, educated people are really good at doing this, uh, but not for good reasons. <laughs> they have the beliefs already, just like the rest of us, just that they're better at gathering data to support them. The way it works is that our brains are belief engines. That is, we connect the dots between uh, A and B. A appears connected to B, and this is called association learning. Nothing new here. This is, you know, 50 years old, 60 years old, goes back to Skinner. Actually, even older than that, goes back to Pavlov of, uh, you know, you take the dog, you put him in there, you ring the bell, you give him some food, he salivates. You ring the bell, you give him some food, he salivates. You ring the bell, he salivates. He's associated A with B. And that's called classical conditioning, and they learn it fairly quick. Or you put the rat in the box, and, um, and he's very motivated to eat because you haven't fed him since yesterday's experiment. <laughs> it's what you do with animals in a lab. In the case of people, you can't really do that, so you give them a choice. These are your students between doing a deadly boring term paper or coming in and participating in a fun experiment. <laughs> so much of psychological science is based on 18 to 20 year olds in college, which I think is problematic. That's a whole other area for skepticism that I tend to write about someday. Let's run it on, you know, 50-year-olds that you know, are downtown with jobs and see if you get the same effect. Anyway, uh, so every time the rat gets near the bar, because they're moving around, they become more active when they're hungry. And so every time he gets near the bar, you press a little button, and the little food comes down the tube there, comes down the tube into the little hopper, and he hears it, and he runs over there and eats it. Next time, you make him go a little bit closer before you hit the switch, and closer still, and then maybe you wait till he touches it, and you close the switch. And then at some point, he bumps it hard enough, he closes the switch himself, it makes a little clicking sound, 
And then he realizes if I press the bar, the pellet comes down. And that's called shaping. It takes about 20 minutes to do that with a rat. Uh, so they're, they're, either way, they're associating A with B. And their brains actually change. There's a, like new interneural connections that grow. And the more they do it, the, the neural pathway gets reinforced and so on. This is, how it, uh, this is how this research used to be done when I was in graduate school. Believe it or not, that was a high-tech computer back then. <laughs> That's the, the wiring there is like the... the um, the, how we programmed it. This, this, is the, this is a Texas Instrument programmable calculator that was cutting edge. I typed my thesis on an electric, IBM Selectric typewriter. By the way, these, if you don't recognize them, these are called pencils. Um, <laughs> and that's paper. Those are data sheets. Yeah. And that's one of my pigeons. Uh, we, were, we were operantly training them to peck these keys, and then once they figured out pecking the keys gets them Rewards, then, they, then you change the reward structure to see if they pick the left key more than the right key. If you give them twice as much reinforcement on the left key, will they press it twice as many times? Not quite, you know, the matching law, testing the matching law and all that stuff. What we discovered, what Skinner discovered decades before that, is that if you randomly reinforce them, that is, you get, put them on a variable, random variable interval schedule of reinforcement, whatever they were doing just before the, they got rewarded, they repeat that. And that might be like turning clockwise or counterclockwise once or twice or touching the wall with their wing or whatever. And then they'll just repeat that behavior because they think that's what will get me the reward because it happened last time. And that's called superstitious behavior or magical thinking. Now, I know their brains are small, but if you go to Las Vegas, Nevada, you'll see this principle at work <laughs> in human pigeons. <laughs> Very powerful. I call it patternicity, the tendency to find meaningful patterns in both meaningful and meaningless noise. So the question is, do you, is the pattern real or not? And so when we make those decisions about whether the patterns are real or not, we make two kinds of errors. A type 1 error, false positive, is believing the pattern is real when it isn't. You think A is connected to B, but, well, it's not. Or a type 2 error, a false negative, is not believing a pattern is real when it is. You, you missed it. Now. Here's our thought experiment for the evening. Imagine you are a hominid on the plains of Africa three and a half million years ago. Your name is Lucy. Thank you. Americans don't always get that. <laughs> Lucy? You mean the TV show? No, no. <laughs> the little hominid, strelopithecine, discovered by Donald Johansson. You know, like in the Gary Larson cartoon with the strelopithecines at the cave party. And the guy's going, you're not the Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, guys will say anything to get their genes into the next generation. <laughs> Just remember that. <laughs> You've heard it from a guy. Anyway, so uh, you're hominid on the plains of Africa three and a half million years ago. You hear a rustle in the grass. Is it a dangerous predator or is it just the wind? Well, if you believe that the rustle in the grass is a dangerous predator, and it turns out it's just the wind, you've made a type 1 error. False positive. You thought A was connected to B and it's not. But that's a relatively low-cost error to make. You see animals doing this all the time on the fur, fin, and feather shows on the various television networks that uh, broadcast these things. They just become more skittish and cautious, and they move around the noise. On the other hand, if you believe the rustle in the grass is just the wind, and it turns out it's a dangerous predator, you're lunch. Congratulations, you've just been given a Darwin Award for taking yourself out of the gene pool before reproducing. Thank you very much. <laughs> and we are the descendants of those who are most likely to make more type 1 errors than type uh, 2 errors. Why? Because of the cost analysis. It's just a, it's just a behavioral cost-benefit analysis. That is, they'll occur whenever the cost of making a type 1 error, this is the only formula of the night, the cost of making a type 1 error is less than the cost of making a type 2 error. Now, when is that? The problem here is that assessing the difference between type 1 and 2 errors is highly problematic especially in the split-second life and death situation. So the default position is just assume that all patterns are real. Assume all rustles in the grass are dangerous predators and not the wind. Now, why can't we get it right? Why can't we just wait and collect more data? Because that will also get you lunch. Because predators don't wait around while you collect more data to decide if they're predators or not. Uh, and so, the default rule of thumb by the brain is pretty much everything you see in here is probably true. Uh, and whether it is or not really doesn't matter because you haven't made the other kind of error, which can be too costly. Thus, it is we tend to believe most of the things we hear.
Now we have good brain scan research on this showing which areas of the brain light up when you understand something to be true or when you agree it's true. These are just statements you're reading inside a brain scanner and you're pushing A for yes and B for no or whatever. And you can see which areas of the brain are lighting up. These are usually dopaminergic areas, areas of the brain related to dopamine, which is related to any kind of learning, positive reinforcement, anything that feels good. Dopamine, dopamine, dopamine is our favorite drug in your brain for learning something for positive reinforcement and so on. It turns out just agreeing with a statement as being true gets, gives you a little burst of dopamine. Well, there's more blood in the brain going to those dopamine areas that shows up on the brain scan. Anyway, that's the technical way of saying it. The, the, the fMRI brain scans are not measuring neural activity. They're measuring blood flow going there, just so you know that. There's a little room for skepticism there. It's not quite the new phrenology. I like the research, but we should be cautious about that. When you see those beautiful pictures in the popular science magazine, here's your brain. There's the God module. There's the money module. The, it, that, that's a bit of a, a, a ruse. Um, it's not any one person's brain. It's a statistical average of all the subjects that were in the experiment because everybody's heads are slightly different sized and they move around a little bit and you have to, you have to work all that out. And then you add artificial color for where the binary digits show there was more blood moving into that area. Anyway, all that is just another way of saying it's just a form of collecting more data to show those, those changes in the brain. Okay, so let's look at some examples of patternicity. Finding meaningful patterns in random noise. Here's a rock formation that looks like a horse. A horse is a horse is a horse, of course, unless it's a frog. <laughs> Conflicting data confuses us. How about this? What does this look like? That's a cow where the cashmere comes from, right? If you didn't see the cow, there he is, or she, <laughs> sorry. But once I've given you the prime, pops back in, right? How about here? Sure, you see the Dalmatian dog. If those of you who didn't, there it is. And once I've given you the uh, cognitive psychologist called this priming, I'm priming the brain, telling you this is what you're supposed to see. And when I go back to it, it should pop out easier, right? How about here? Saturn, sure, you see Saturn. How about here? What do you see? What do you see? Nothing. Nothing. That's right, there's nothing here. <laughs> Very good. If you think you saw something, by the way, see me afterwards, because this is a signal for brain damage. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I want to talk about patternicity, superstition, and control. There's different factors or variables that go into making some of us more or less likely to see patterns that are not real. If the environment you're in is uncertain, makes you anxious, you feel out of control, you are more likely to see illusory patterns as real. My favorite example from the American sport of baseball is uh, Wade Boggs here, one of the greatest hitters of all time, uh, who was so superstitious when he was uh, batting, he had all sorts of uh, rituals surrounding uh, chicken. He had to eat chicken before every game. He became so proficient at cooking chicken, he even wrote a book, cookbook about it called Foul Tips. Foul <laughs> Tips, anyway. But only when they're batting are these athletes superstitious. When they're fielding, they're not. Fielders are successful 90 to 95% of the time. They almost never fail. Batters, on the other hand, fail seven out of 10 times. If you, if you, you can be a Hall of Fame, all-time great, and, and still fail seven out of 10 times, right? So it's a very uncertain uh, event. So it makes you feel anxious and less in control and therefore more superstitious. We know that patternicities occur uh, more on the right hemisphere than the left hemisphere. Peter Breuger ran an experiment uh, through one of these split brain type experiments uh, in which more meaningful patterns were uh, perceived in the right hemisphere via the left visual field than in the left hemisphere via the right visual field. So I'll come back to that in a moment. Carl Sagan made this prescient observation in his Pulitzer Prize winning book. If you haven't read it, it's a great book, The Dragons of Eden. There is no doubt that right hemisphere intuitive thinking may perceive patterns and connections too difficult for the left hemisphere, but it may also detect patterns where none exist. Skeptical and critical thinking is not a hallmark of the right hemisphere. So although this is a little over exaggerated, perhaps by half on the division of labor in your head, we can roughly speaking say you have two brains in your head. 
that do different things. The whole brain is very modular. I, I tend to agree with the modularity theorists in evolutionary psychology, that our brains are organs that evolved to solve problems in our ancestral environment. And solving problems usually has to do with very specific things, not just one big global intelligence, although maybe there is something like G. Anyway, that's a, that's a different debate. But roughly speaking, holistic thought, intuition, creativity, art and music happen more in the right hemisphere than in the left hemisphere where we have more science and math and language and lo logic and so on. Again, it's a slight exaggeration, uh, but not by much. And so I'll come back to that here. Uh, with the right brain, left brain thing. Another experiment, Peter Breuger and his colleague Christine Moore subjected uh, uh, subjects to a dopamine, or dopamine through L-DOPA. L-DOPA is a drug given to Parkinson's patients. It increases the amount of dopamine in their brains. It uh, seems to uh, quell the tremors a little bit. Uh, before the, uh, this experiment, they gave these subjects a paper pencil test, just like 40 items. Do you believe in ESP? Do you think astrology works? Do you think Bigfoot's real? Do you think UFOs represent alien craft from other planets? And so on and so on. The whole retinue of stuff that we skeptics are skeptical of, right? And so some people score like low, um, a one or two, and others are very high, like a nine or a 10. So you can kind of get a group of subjects that are more skeptical and a group that are more believers. You give them all dopamine. Turns out that they all then tend to see illusory patterns as real. Scrambled faces as real, jumbled words as normal. In other words, dopamine increases the amount of a patternicity in the brain, but the effect was stronger with skeptics than believers, which kind of seems counterintuitive until you think about it for a second. If you're already way up here on the belief scale, you think everything is real, then giving you more dopamine, there's not much room to go. Well, I already believe it's real, so. But if you're like me and you're way down here, you're pretty skeptical of most of these things, there's plenty of room to go and it makes you more like, hey, that's my explanation. Now, I've, taught, I've spoken about patternicity in sort of a humorous way, like, isn't it funny how we see these things that aren't real? That's not necessarily the case. I mean, uh, finding patterns in the world is what creativity is all about. Unfortunately, it's also closely related to madness. And it's a signal-to-noise ratio problem. That is, you want to be able to find enough of the, you want to have a mind open enough to recognize new patterns as real, musical genres, beautiful new art, discoveries in science that lead to Nobel Prizes. These are important new patterns that no one else has seen. That's a good thing. But you don't want to have a brain so open-minded that you think uh, everything is real and your brains fall out, right? So th that's the rub. So my example I use in, in the book uh, of two famous scientists. On the, on the left there is uh, Richard Feynman, who won the Nobel Prize in quantum physics for his work in quantum electrodynamics and his invention or discovery or whatever you want to call it of the Feynman diagrams. These Feynman diagrams are uh, attempts to visually describe how subatomic particles interact, which is normally done with these massive long uh, mathematical equations. And these diagrams show how, you know, the, in, in these particle accelerators and in the, in these subatomic particles interact and they do these things and, uh, and so forth. Uh, and these diagrams are so effective for doing this kind of physics that they are still used today, half a century after Feynman uh, created them. And in fact, uh, this particular one here on this picture is on his van. Uh, one of Feynman's uh, graduate students, uh, painted Feynman diagrams on his 1976 cargo, Dodge cargo van. And it's still around. I, we have the van. I've, I've orchestrated uh, salvaging it. I found it in a gas station parked in uh, near Pasadena. Weeds growing up into the wheel wells like, oh my God, don't you know this is Feynman's van? These are Feynman diagrams. And uh, anyway, so it's now parked in, in South Pasadena in a, in a garage. So if anybody comes to LA and you want to see Feynman's van, I'll take you to show it to you. It's pretty cool. As the story goes, he was uh, driving up, you know, uh, on Colorado Boulevard there where the Rose Parade is, and, uh, and somebody had a stop sign, rolled down the window and said, hey, how come you have Feynman diagrams on your van? He said, because I'm Feynman. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought would be pretty cool to, to be able to say. By contrast, on the right is John Nash, who also won the Nobel Prize in economics for his discovery of of uh, game theory, that is his, his employment of game theory to discover how um, different strategies are used by different contestants in a game. Uh, and so you can try to outwit your, your opponent by, by changing strategies and so on, but then your opponent changes their strategy to meet your strategy, and at some point they reach what's called a Nash equilibrium, 
where neither one of them has anything to gain by changing strategies, and so there's a certain uh, stability. This turns out to describe um, like corporations competing in an industry where certain prices end up, it looks like collusion to uh, monopoly fear, fearing government agents, but in fact, it's not really intentional collusion. You know, all universities charge pretty much the same, <laughs> since we're here. Uh, and, uh, but, but most, this happens in most industries. Mutual assured destruction is a Cold War strategy. Works pretty well as long as you know the other guy also doesn't want to die. I'm not so sure about the mutual assured destruction in the modern world where there's certain groups of people who, are, who don't mind dying. They're looking forward to it. 72 virgins, yay. Uh, <clears throat> maybe this is not a good calculating thing. Okay, I know it's more subtle than that. We, okay. But you may recall when, um, uh, when John Nash was uh, uh, you know, played by Russell Crowe in the film A Beautiful Mind, he, was, he also saw patterns that were not real. Uh, right? The gov secret government agents and, and uh, secret jobs he was working for, for the government, and conspiracies and cabals, and, and uh, not in the movie, but in the book, uh, you know, talking to uh, extraterrestrial uh, 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 aliens that were talking to him and giving him instructions and so on. He's schizophrenic. So on the one hand, it's, it, you can win a Nobel Prize if you see new patterns that no one else has seen. On the other hand, maybe you see too many patterns that are just not real and you're crazy. Okay, so this is not just a frivolous thing. There's actually a good database on this by Nancy Andreessen at University of Iowa. She brings creative artists and musicians, scientists, and so on into her lab and scans their brains, has them do their thing that they're doing, and, and, uh, and, and, and then takes a life history of them. And it turns out uh, it, they are statistically significantly more likely to either have manic depression or schizophrenia themselves or have it in their immediate family, either their own children or their siblings or their parents. So there, are, there does seem to be some relationship between being a little nutty, a little crazy, a little, you know, I see new creative things all over the place, and, and that wins you all sorts of accolades from your peers of, in your field, or uh, you end up uh, diagnosed as mad. Anyway, so uh, it turns out that what, what, what you're thinking about also influences uh, the kinds of patterns you see. And uh, so if I, like in this example, because we're all, now sensitive to the environmental movement and the save the whales and save the dolphins. You all see dolphins in this picture, right? <laughs> you see, there's a dolphin there. There's a dolphin. That, there's a little dolphin there. Here's a dolphin. That's a dolphin tail there, guys. <laughs> um, sometimes ad agencies take advantage of the idea that we see patterns that we think are one thing, and it turns out they're com something completely different. These are Via Una sandals, carefully airbrushed sandals, I, I must say, and cropped and so on. Conflicting data also plays into patterns we already have in our memories of what we think we're seeing when, of course, you see the lamp there in the room. <laughs> um, now, this picture is a nice illusion because it works as long as you only look here and below, but if you look here and above, then you get conflicting data. Okay, so the patterns are formed, models in our memories are created out of these patterns, new data comes in, we do a match to see if there's a match there or not. So if I rotate it, then you can see how it's done. It's just a staged photograph. Now, the impossible crate illusion also tricks our brain because we have patterns of the way uh, angles are formed, we have neurons in your visual cortex that only fire when you see this angle, and others that only fire when you see this angle, and others that only fire when something moves this direction, and others that only fire when something moves this direction, and so on and so on. You have a virtual infinite number of possibilities in your environment to see that can be patterned into your visual cortex. But, but we have nothing like that in our experience. So that's how it tricks the brain. Now you may say, oh, Shermer, that's in 2D. It's easy to trick the brain in 2D. Well, here's the impossible crate illusion in 3D by my friend Jerry Andrus, the late Jerry Andrus, who uh, specialized in creating magic tricks and illusions based on two-dimensional illusions. Can you see how it's done? Here is the reveal. So the photographer is way off to the side, and the boards appear to overlap, and so on. But even knowing how it's done, it's still very powerful because the model of how curves and angles happen are already there in your brain. Here's a new illusion that was discovered uh, last year. 
uh, by McGill University neuroscientists. There's a contest every year for the best illusion of the year, which is pretty cool. You can find it online. Uh, the illusion is, turns out the uh, Leaning Tower of Pisa is, it's not leaning. That was an illusion, no, just kidding. <laughs> Uh, the illusion is that one of these appears to be leaning more than the other one. They're the same photograph, just side by side. And of course, the one on the right appears to be leaning far more. Now, why is that? They think it has, to, and by the way, just to prove to you that that's the case, you can, you can look at that angle and that angle, you can see that they're the same. Their explanation is that when you stand and you look at buildings, they, they normally appear to be uh, converging. There's a convergence point. Uh, but that doesn't happen here, in fact, they appear to be diverging, and so it throws off our brain. I don't agree with that. I think it's that you're comparing this angle to that angle, not this angle to that angle. And so that angle is much wider than that angle, and so it appears on your visual cortex as something really screwy going on. And you can see that in this photograph, where you compare this angle to this one, not this angle to that one. And so that throws us off. You know, I'm just sort of going through multiple examples of patternicities and then how illusions teach us something about how the brain works. Another one of these is how we tend to see faces everywhere. Here you only need three data points to create a, um, a, a face, the illusion of a face. This is probably Photoshop, but it's cool anyway. Uh, and here is another illusion. Well, it, <laughs> you of course immediately recognize it as the American president. But then if you look at it for a second, it's like, wait, one of them is a little off. Which one of them appears a little weird? The left one or the right one? Yeah, okay, so I'll take that left one and rotate it so it's now on the right. <laughs> so what's happening here is you have uh, two neural pathways in the temporal lobes just above your ears uh, dedicated to facial recognition. Let's just call it our facial recognition software. Uh, and so the first type does a quick scan of a face. It's a face. Uh, oh, it's a face of somebody I know, I recognize, right? And then the slower neural pathway scans the details, eyes, the mouth, the nose, the ears, and so on. And so then those things come into conflict. Faces are easy to find. Faces are important to us in evolution. So we've evolved networks that are dedicated to facial recognition. It's how we assess other people, whether we like them or not, whether we know them or not, whether we trust them or not. By the way, the deja vu experience is explained, I think, by this, this phenomenon, where you have a pattern in your, in your brain of the way the world is structured. And you get some new data that's pretty close to that, and it feels like a match, right? So it's like, all, there's only so many variations in town designs. And so you go somewhere new you've never been and you have like this deja vu experience like, whoa, this is so weird. I think there's like a gas station when I turn right here and there's a restaurant on the left. Sure enough, there it is. Well, pretty much all towns have a gas station and a restaurant and a corn silo or whatever. Uh, and so you get something like a close match. Or you think you see somebody you know. It's like, I, I've seen you. Some, are you, did we meet some, you know, that kind of thing. What, what you're doing is you're collecting more data. You're, 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 your facial recognition software is scanning and scanning, looking at the eyes, the mouth, and so on. Is that a match for that pattern I already have in my memory, or is it not? That's what's going on there. So, of course, we see something, again, just a couple of data points. This is shot in 1976 by the uh, Viking, NASA's Viking mission that landed on Mars. Before it landed, it took pictures all of Mars. And so the ufologists got very excited about this. Look, the Martians have built these gigantic faces to signal to us, here we are. And they wrote letters to NASA saying, oh, please go take a close up of the Martian face, you know. So finally in 2000, they did. There it is, it's the face on Mars. It's a little light, uh, uh, sorry about the lights, but if you squint, you can get the face to pop back out. There's, you know, there's the eyes, the nose, the mouth. By squinting, you're reducing the, the, the granularity of the data from fine grain to coarse grain, and so, it becomes sort of a crude face again, and then your facial recognition software kicks in, and, and you're off and running. There's other faces all over the place. Here's the happy face on Mars, right? And uh, this is a beautiful one I, I just discovered. Somebody sent me in Canada. It's just uh, near uh, Calgary, Canada. It's an Indian head. It's a valley. It's about a 10-mile wide valley. That's a road going up into it here. Anyway, it's pretty cool. You can find it on Google. <clears throat> and just if you Google... Uh, like Indian head illusion or something like that, you'll find it. Uh, somebody just sent me this one last week. It's pretty cool. It's on a garage door, just tree shadow of a face. 
pretty striking. My favorite of all time is the nun bun. <laughs> Discovered by a Tennessee baker in 1996. Laminated that bun and charged people five bucks a head to come see it. Until he got a cease and desist letter from Mother Teresa's lawyers. <laughs> Charity only goes so far, damn it. <laughs> Here's Our Lady of the Chicago Underpass. Uh, it's just a water stain, but, you know, the deeply religious people and some not-so-religious people, Satan loves you, uh, came to pay tribute to it. Some people saw in this bonfire uh, Pope John Paul II. Another one of my favorites is the Virgin Mary on a grilled cheese sandwich, which sold on eBay to a Las Vegas casino for $28,500. Only in America, yeah! A cheese sandwich, of which somebody even took a bite out of. I mean, it's just, <laughs> come on. But it's a striking face, and you can't hardly miss it. Uh, I have no idea what the Virgin Mary looks like, and I'm pretty sure no one else does either. But there's sort of an iconography in Western religious paintings of what the Virgin Mary is supposed to look like. To me, you know, it looks a little bit more like Madonna, <laughs> perhaps Jane Russell in that sort of 1950s starlet look. Uh, here's the Virgin Mary on the side of a building in Clearwater, Florida. This was a bank building purchased by a... Um, a Minnesota evangelical church, which, um, which Randy, the amazing Randy, Richard Dawkins, and I went to visit a couple years ago on, on a good Friday. So there were quite a few people there uh, with their crutches and wheelchairs to be healed by the mirac miraculous building. They had erected this gigantic uh, crucifix there. Uh, anyway, so we walked around the back of the building, and it tur turns out that, oops, sorry, turns out that Clearwater, Florida isn't. Now, the water isn't very clear. It's kind of mineralized. You can see it in the grass. So wherever there's a sprinkler head and a palm tree, you get this kind of staining on the windows. In fact, I found one on the back side of the building that was, they started to wipe off because I guess you can only have one miracle per building. Um, <laughs> but there you can see the sprinkler head and, and the, the palm tree was there. They cut it down so you could see it better, I guess. So again, back to Hume's question, what's more likely to be true? You know, is it really a miracle of Mary? Or is it a miracle of Marge? <laughs> well, I'm not Catholic, but I am a Simpsons fan, so that's what I saw. Hey, it looks like Marge Simpson. Okay, let's go back to our thought experiment, a hominid on the plains of Africa three and a half million years ago here, a wrestle in the grass. Is it a dangerous predator or just the wind? What's the difference between the wind and a dangerous predator? The wind is an inanimate force. A dangerous predator is an intentional agent. It intends to eat me, and that probably can't be good. So uh, this is what Dan Dennett calls the intentional stance. We, we take a stand, and we assume that there's intention out there. I'm more interested in the agent part than the intention part, and I call this agenticity, the tendency to infuse patterns we find with meaning, intention, and agency, often invisible beings from the top down. I think this is the basis of... Soul, spirits, ghosts, gods, demons, angels, aliens, intelligent designers, government conspiracists, and all manner of invisible agents with power and intention are believed to haunt our world and control our lives. I think agenticity is the basis of animism, and polytheism, and monotheism, even in the belief in aliens. You know, if you look at the uh, literature of science fiction or even the SETI scientists who talk about uh, what the aliens will be like, even, even thoughtful people like Carl Sagan writing about the aliens. You know, they're always more technologically advanced, scientifically advanced, morally superior to us, coming from on high to rescue us from global warming or nuclear war. In the case of, you recognize the iconic scene from The Day the Earth Stood Still, 1951, or the remake last year with Keanu Reeves. Uh, and, uh, and instead of nuclear war, it was global warming, right? These are always reflecting our own neuroses about life, right? <laughs> so, um, and, uh, and, and so, uh, but again, it's sort of that they're up there. They will rescue us. They will come, come to us from on high. Uh, or intelligent designers. The intelligent designers are always thought to be this, you know, just like us, but smarter and able to genetically engineer life and that sort of thing. From on high, coming down to, to stir the particles to create things, right? Or even conspiracy theories, I think, are, are in a way granting omniscience and omnipotence to humans to be able to like, run the world. Like the Illuminati uh, is one of the popular ones, that there's 12 guys in London you know, calling the shots, running the world, and so on, this sort of thing. Uh, and they're, they're ever elusive. <clears throat> Although I must say, I had a scare 
uh, watching this HBO film, Too Big to Fail, about the American financial meltdown and how the Fed uh, chairman and the head of the Treasury, um, you know, Bernanke and his whole crew uh, called in the, like, the top 10 CEOs of the major banks, you know, the Bank of America, Citibank, and, and uh, Goldman Sachs, and so on. And, it, and they had that meeting in September, September 18th of 2008 and said, we're not leaving this room till we solve this problem because on Monday, there is no economy. I thought, oh my God, it's 12 guys in a room running the world. <laughs> I mean, did they really have that kind of power? Whoa, it scared me a little bit. Be a little skeptical. <laughs> anyway, conspiracies do happen. They're a little bit of a different species of belief than other things that I study because they happen. Lincoln was assassinated by a conspiracy. They were supposed to kill uh, not only Lincoln, but uh, Vice President Johnson, Secretary of State Stewart, Secretary of War Stanton, and so on. They were all lined up to be killed. And we knew about it within hours. Normally, that's what happens. You find out who the other assassins are. In the case of JFK, I, I'm a lone assassin guy, although there's still people uh, ch chasing this one down. I got an email yesterday from, two days ago, from somebody about the, you don't believe the Warren Commission, do you? It's like, not the Warren Commission. I just got done with the 9-11 guys. <laughs> Let's go back to Kennedy, right? But if you ever do get a chance to go to America, and if you ever do end up in Dallas on any given day, any uh, of the year, any time of the day, there are the conspiracy theorists are there. And for a five buck tip, they'll take you around and show you where the shooters were. Like on the grassy knoll behind the wooden fence, or my favorite one, in the manhole. You know, it's like they popped up, bam, shot them, and went back down like a video game. <laughs> so, uh, like the, yeah, anyway, I don't want to talk about the 9-11 guys. They tend to follow me around in my lectures. So, <clears throat> all right, now what's the brain? Let's go back to the brain. Talk about what's the basis of agent -icity. Okay, first of all, it has to do with dualism. We're natural born dualists. Almost everybody tends to think there are two things in the universe, corporeal and incorporeal, brain and mind, body and soul, two substances, right? And that's why we get the humor and, uh, and enjoy movies like uh, Tom Hanks in Big where he changes ages, or 13 going on 30 where Jennifer Gardner changes ages, or Freaky Friday where J Jamie Lee Curtis and Lindsay Lohan switch bodies. Think about for the, of course, we, we understand, oh yeah, they switch bodies, wait, what's switching? What's doing the switching? Well, their soul. Well, but what's that? Well, it's like their personality, you know, ha, 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 the mother is now in the high school talking about boys and the teenager is now in the boardroom and confused. Hilarity follows typical American humor movie. Okay, but we get the humor because we, we buy into the premise that we have some kind of mind or soul that could be transferred, uh, transplanted. If you think about it though for a second, the, a brain transplant is the one transplant where you want to be the donor, not the recipient. <laughs> right? Because that's where you are. You are in your brain. I'm a monist. There's just brain. There's no mind. Mind is just another one of these fuzzy words that people use to describe something they don't understand. It's just a word to use what the, to describe what the brain is doing. And you know I'm right because <laughs> when the brain dies, the mind goes with it. Uh, senility, Alzheimer's, dementia, as the neurons die, Cell by cell, the memory fades. The person's personality becomes smaller. Everything they do becomes smaller. Their handwriting gets smaller. Their steps get smaller. They walk slowly. They hunch over a little bit more. Their memory gets smaller. Their, their personality their, that, that used to be vibrant gets smaller. Everything gets smaller. As the neurons die, the mind is gone. No brain, no mind. Therefore, there's just brain. Now my friend Deepak Chopra disagrees with me. He says, no, no, the mind is out there somewhere else, in the quantum foam, whatever. <laughs> so where is it when Aunt Millie's brain dies from Alzheimer's, where does her brain, her mind go? When the brain is, where does it go? He said, the matrix. <laughs> the matrix, I said, when we debated last year. Where is that, I mean, I can get it at Netflix, I know, but. Uh, and I love the movie, but that's a movie. They just made it up. You know, these are Hollywood screenwriters. They just made it. There is no matrix. Right. Okay, so, well, I think. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But we're, we naturally think that there is su such a thing as our soul, our personality. Now, it's not impossible that this could happen. This is a sci sort of a science fiction scenario that we may not be too far away. This is what uh, Ray Kurzweil and the Singularity folks think could happen. Uh, given enough computing power, you could somehow download all your memories, all those neural network sequences of patterns that constitutes all your memories and so on, put it in a giant supercomputer that can be reconstructed in a virtual reality, and there you are, you're resurrected in a giant computer somewhere. This is like the AI stuff. We're five years away and always will. Well, you know, Kurzweil thinks we're, we're there in 2030. Um, and my other futurist friends tell me, forget that, it's 2130 or 2230 or 2500. We're a long ways from anything like that. But in principle, you see what they're trying to do. There's a pattern that can be placed onto some platform that's a little more durable than the electric meat of our brains. It's just meat, it's protein, electric meat. That's all it is and it doesn't last but for a few decades and that's it. So it'd be nice if we could put it on silicon or something that lasts you know, maybe a, a few hundred years or if it's running on Microsoft software a few months. Anyway, so, <laughs> you know we are living in the digital dark ages, right? The digital dark ages. Can you run any of the programs you had back in the 90s on your current computer? No. Can you, can you up, upload those photographs and all those videos you took with those little video cartridges that you don't have the camera for anymore? No. But you can pick up a book that's 500 years old and read it. Okay, anyway. <laughs> Second point on the agency, theory of mind. Theory of mind is the ability to mind read, not the psychic stuff. Uh, I mean to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, to take their stance. What's it like to be you? Uh, will you get this joke or not? Uh, so I think about, okay, if I was sitting in the audience and I was you, would I understand? Okay, so I'm just mind reading. This is all human relationships are mind reading. This is what the golden rule is. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, what, how would I know that? Well, I put myself in your shoes and I think, okay, would I be upset about, yes, I would. Okay, I better not do it. Or maybe I'll do it anyway. But, but you know that, 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 that they're thinking like this, right? So this is the old, you know, I knew that she said that he thought that he was going to, that I knew that he, you know. This is that theory of mind. We can do it, maybe some other species, not sure. Uh, this is the red dot test of self-awareness. Uh, that is, uh, if you put a red dot on your forehead and you look in the mirror, you'll go, oh, that's weird, and you'll wipe it off. If you put it on a chimp's forehead, they'll look at it and flick at it. Like, to do that, you have to look in the mirror and go, that's me, so I'm self-aware. And there's something wrong with me, I'm gonna fix it, right? So, but if you put your dog in front of the mirror, you put a red dot, they're just like, whatever. <laughs> they don't even know that's... Uh, so probably chimps and gorillas, all, all the great apes, some of the primates maybe, mostly just the great apes. It appears apparently dolphins uh, can do this. Well, they have flippers, so they can't, you, know, you can't do the red dot. But if you put them, put them in front of a mirror, they get very excited and they look inside their mouth, which is interesting. Like, Whoa, I've never seen that before. And, and the males look at their genitals, which I think is just very revealing about their intelligence and ours. Whoa, look at that. <laughs> anyway, you can put subjects in these brain scanners. You can give them these little tests that they do to show that they're self-aware and aware that others are aware. You know, so it's like you show them a picture of somebody you know or you love that you're in a relationship with and you inflict pain on this other person or you actually have like a video showing them this and the areas of the brain that light up are the areas that would light up if you were feeling the pain. This is literally, I'll feel your pain uh, of Clinton. I mean, this, there's something to this. Uh, and, uh, and so we're able to project. Adam Smith wrote about this. His first book before The Wealth of Nations was... Uh, a theory of moral sentiments. And he argued that the, the basis of all morality in civil society is our ability to project into and anticipate what somebody else feels. This is theory of mind. And, you, and, and these are the brain areas that light up when you do that. And then finally, the temporal lobes. I've mentioned these several times. Um, back in the early 60s when they first began doing these, this research uh, uh, of uh, poking around inside brains, it's a, really, uh, it's a really curious way to get data. 
Uh, you actually take subjects that are epileptics that are about to get open brain surgery for some reason, or for other reasons, but you get them to wa sign a waiver that says, is it okay if we wake you up while you're having your brain surgery and then poke around in there with electrodes and ask you questions? And amazingly, they go, yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> and so this is how neuroscientists map the brain. You just poke around with electrodes, you turn them on, and it causes the neurons to fire, and then the per person reports what they're feeling at that moment. And so you can do that by poking around in these different areas, particularly the temporal lobes, and people will report these uh, out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, deja vu experiences, the presence or sense of presence of others, angelic voices. If you go deeper through the temporal lobes into the limbic system where the amygdala is and the whole emotional software of our brain, you can um, produce these feelings of intense meaningfulness, depersonalization, connection with God or the cosmos. Um, we can study near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences in this context. Again, these are these kind of unsolved mysteries that people come to us with. How do you skeptic scientists explain out-of-body experiences? Isn't this evidence of the afterlife and so on? Well, you can replicate these in laboratories. For example, this fellow, Major General James Winery of the United States Air Force, discovered what he called G-force loss of consciousness, or G-lock in which his pilots had accelerated at a high rate till they black out as part of their training. You know, 2Gs, 3Gs, 4Gs, 5Gs, 9Gs, 10Gs, boom, you're out. Uh, all it is is just uh, squishing the blood toward the center of your body. Uh, and so the cortex begins to shut down. As the cortex shuts down, for some reason, it causes this sort of going through the tunnel, the white light at the end of the tunnel, uh, that the whole out-of-body floating kind of experience that people have. You can do it through that same experiment I talked about with poking around. This was um, an experiment done in 2003, reported in Nature, <coughs> might have been science, uh, of a Swiss um, woman who had epilepsy, poked around right there in the temporal lobe of the red dot there, and they created right there in the room. I'm floating out of my body. And you just crank the electricity up a little bit. Whoa, I'm way up on the ceiling now. And bring it back down. Okay, I'm back down on the, she's just lying there, right? Oh, my right arm, my left arm, my left leg, my right leg, and so on, just by poking around, right? So it's just brain, no mind, just brain. So again, what's more likely on these experiences, that they have a natural explanation or not? Like in the alien abduction phenomenon, does it represent human alien contact or human psychology? Well, we know, for example, with sleep paralysis is our explanation for this, like with Henry Fusilli's The Nightmare. Several centuries ago, the English referred to nighttime sensations of chest pressure from witches or other supernatural beings as mare from Anglo-Saxon marin to crush. So a nightmare was the crusher who comes in the night. Now, the narratives of today sound very similar, but they didn't call them uh, demons, incubi or succubi. Today we call them aliens, but it's the same phenomenon. A certain percentage of the population, as they're falling asleep or as they're waking up, have these sort of unusual experiences. Sometimes they wake up in the middle of a dream, but they're not really awake. Uh, they're still in the dream, but they think they're awake and they feel paralyzed, like they can't move and they feel chest pressure, like there's something sitting. Now, if you live 500 years ago in a demon haunted world, you would have you know, a little incubi or succubi, a little demon there. Today, it's the alien. So the, the culture tells us what to call our unusual psychological experiences. Um, and so to that extent, I'd say there's no such thing as the supernatural or the paranormal. There's just the natural, the normal, and all the stuff we can't explain yet, but that's what we're doing. We're trying to explain it naturally through these kinds of uh, understanding of the brain and how it works. Uh, now, I had a, an alien abduction experience. So those of you that have read my books or columns will already be familiar with this story. But in 1983, I was abducted by aliens on the side of the road in Nebraska, uh, on a lonely rural highway in Nebraska. That's, of course, that's always where it happens, right? They never land at, like, at the White House. You know? The aliens are here. Uh, and so I was traveling down this lonely rural highway. This big craft with bright lights comes up over my left shoulder and stops me on the side of the road. And scoops me and puts me into the space, well, they tried to abduct me into the spacecraft, and I resisted. And I knew they were aliens, the aliens actually looked like humans, but I could tell that they were aliens because they had stiff little fingers. And that was the clue, because, and so that's the explanation. When I was a child, there was a popular television sci-fi show called The Invaders, in which aliens were taking over Earthlings, and somehow they could traverse the vast distances of interstellar space and clone people and look just like them. Uh, but they couldn't solve the lingabit problem in their little fingers. <laughs> it's like, well, okay. But when you're, you know, eight, it doesn't matter. 
Uh, and so I, at that moment, on the side of the road, I just had this experience, which was caused by sleep deprivation in my case. Um, this was part of the Race Across America, this transcontinental bike race that goes LA to New York, and uh, that me and three other guys created in 1982. And in 1983, I tried to see if I could go the entire 3,000 miles without any sleep at all. 10 days without sleep. The record was 11 days, so I figured I could do it. Anyway, I couldn't do it. Um, <laughs> and I had some great hallucinations of being abducted by these people that look just like my support crew members. Everybody in the race <laughs> has a van that follows them with bright lights and so on. Uh, so I'm often accused by alien abductees of saying, how do you know that you weren't really abducted and they planted a false memory of this? Because I have it on film. <laughs> Okay, so Mr. Technician, uh, this is a little low on volume, so crank it up. Uh, so this is me talking about having this weird experience. The next night, when I got to the Mississippi River and the film crew from a television show that was covering the race, uh, filmed me talking about it, so I, here we go. Again, crank it up a little bit. It was midnight, six and a half hours after Lon Haldeman's crossing when Michael Shermer reached the Mississippi. What Diana and I hadn't known when we spoke of a close race earlier was that Shermer was slowing down. As he told Eric Hyden there on the bridge, he was wasted. Still feel pretty mentally alert. No. <laughs> That's why I gotta get some sleep tonight. That's a very, very strange thing to happen to me last night. I mean, like psychotic type experiences. Such as? Uh, thinking my crew was aliens from another planet trying to capture me. <laughs> Sounds ridiculous, but <laughs> that's what I thought. As you can tell, that was a long time ago. <laughs> I also went up to uh, Laurentian University to visit Michael Persinger in his lab. Uh, Persinger, this fellow here, uh, puts this God helmet, he calls it the God helmet, it's a motorcycle helmet on your head, and bombards your temporal lobes with these electromagnetic fields. So it's a little, it's a sort of a cheaper, less invasive way of stimulating your temporal lobes. So I'm going to end with that, I, that thought, that uh, that's the fate of the paranormal. Again, there's no such thing as the paranormal or the supernatural. It's just the normal, natural, and the stuff we can't explain yet. We have to get past using these fuzzy words that don't explain anything. When cosmologists talk about dark energy and dark matter, those aren't explanations. They don't mean them as explanations. They're just linguistic placeholders to call it something until we figure out what it actually is. And that's all the paranormal is, the supernatural. It's just, they're just words we're used to, okay, there's something weird, spooky here. Now let's try to figure it out. So the paranormalist ends it there. The scientist begins the exploration there. It's like, it, 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 if it turns out Deepak is right and the, you know, the consciousness is out there in some quantum state or something like that, and we discovered it, that would no longer be ESP or anything like that. It would just be part of physics and part of neuroscience. Uh, or, which is what I think is the case, is that it, is, that isn't the case, and we'll just quit talking about it because it won't, won't be interesting anymore. Um, and, so, uh, and so that's what science does. The expanding sphere of knowledge pushes out into the unknown. And although as the sphere expands, it comes into contact with more and more unknown, that's true, so it seems like the more we know, the more we know how much we don't know. But on the other hand, remember the ratio of surface area to volume. As the volume gets bigger, the ratio from volume to surface area decreases. So it is good to know more, even though we seemingly encounter more unknown. We are, relatively speaking, learning ever more. And that's why science is the best tool we have for understanding how the world works. Thank you. Thank you.